We've gone and we're live, apparently. <laughs> Hello, Holly. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Um, there we are. It's yet another wet old night here. Uh, my dog's just going to say hello. <laughs> so I hope you're all keeping uh, keeping well. Hey, hey, says Ether Prime. Hi, Ether. Thanks for joining us. Um, and this is our introductory chapter into all things ecology, ecological. Sorry. With um, Frank Herbert's Dune series. Um, and I, I quite like this at this point as we go through all the chapters, to be honest with you. as It's a bit like whenever I was writing this thing. By the time I get to the end of each one, I'm a wee bit weary um if you see what i mean that it started my interest starts to slip a bit and uh so it's nice to pop on to another topic another theme <coughs> excuse me one of the good things about doing this kind of work and, and the very nature of frank herbert's book itself um is it takes you in all sorts of places so if anybody has um and the sound is good you got it in brad before i could ask thank you very much uh, i'm getting better at this isn't it? it's getting a regular wee thing here we are. So if any of you, this is just sort of setting up the, the ecological background for you. Um, the next episode is going to sort of run through a collection of ecological writings that are contemporary to June and sort of give give you a sense of what Frank would have been aware of at the time and also some of this, um, some of the responses to June actually as well, I think, are in there as well, such as um, a, a door into ocean. Um so um, it's quite an interesting chapter, and um, I suppose one of the things about Frank Herbert's Dune series people ask is what's what's relevant about it. Well, well, here we are, <laughs> and I think some of his some of his ideas on ecology are quite interesting. Um, I'm I'm, so, I'm I'm curious to maybe figure out what a modern day ecologist thinks about Frank Herbert's Dune series. Mm. I'd even be kind of curious to see if somebody like Greta Thunberg has read it. Um, or, how, or what sort of position June maintains within the, the ecological awareness, if you see what I mean, it's out there, the activism and so on and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me, as always, folks, I know when I started doing these things, I hadn't mentioned that I actually was a wee bit ill, so I've been ill throughout the whole time, and I do apologise, hence all the coughing. And I'm still bunged up, and I'm not shaking this at all. I think it's just our weather pattern that's hit us at the minute hasn't changed and so i'm still very bunged up, up up here in the head so i hope i don't sound too bad um i, I sound like i'm underwater myself and, and cannot tell if i'm shouting or uh, or speaking at all i have no idea how loud i sound <laughs> uh ether says i have to thank you for this amazing deep dive into my all time all time favorite author it's helping me to think again about the themes he was writing about um thank you very much ether it's been doing the same to me, to be honest with you. It makes me think again about it as well. Um, you mentioned a few times that you have students, so might I ask what subjects do you teach? Ah, um, well, I, I used to be a lecturer. Uh, I used to be a computing lecturer uh, a long time ago. So I was a lecturer before I undertook my PhD, um, and I'd lectured a bit in English uh, literature prior to that. Excuse me a wee second for the cough medicine. Hmm. But basically, because I'm classically educated, as I said, I don't work within the system at all. I'm, I'm arguably Northern Ireland's most unemployable man, either. <laughs> um, so I teach English, English language and English literature. I teach mathematics. I teach uh, computer science, computer studies, uh, whatever they want to call it these days. Um, I teach history occasionally. I cannot teach religious education in this country because it's not really that it's more like religious sophistry um and so it, what's on the curriculum doesn't add up to basically what's called the truth so i don't teach anybody that and i teach a bit of um mathematics for physics what else um <laughs> and i work with um i work with uh, younger kids as well to work towards the um what's called the transfer test here which is a complete mess. So that's kind of what you might call the 11 plus. Um, it's, a, it's a mathematical um, English based test to transfer between between uh, primary and secondary school. So that's what I teach, <laughs> quite a few things. Um, but yeah, you did ask, <laughs> but I, I used to teach an awful lot of different things when I was a, when I was a lecturer and I, work, I worked for the educational psychology department as well. And so. 
uh, worked with uh, students with disabilities, and I, I did all sorts of things and taught in all, all sorts of funny places. Hmm. Brad Rose says, that poor little girl at the attacks, she caught from middle-aged men is ethical bankrupt. Oh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Poor little girl. Oh, you've lost me there. <laughs> mm. Star Japanese students. I'm not sure what you mean either. Or, or have I lost it? Sometimes, guys, I have to say, by the way, when I go, I look at these videos again the next day just to make sure I haven't made any mistakes in what I'm saying said anything really stupid or <laughs> you know that kind of thing um so i have noticed that sometimes i miss little tippity tap things on the thread so if i'm if i'm not getting the as i said sometimes i don't get the gist a wee bit of what's going on there but um ether says read back but hang on i've got I've been on star jumping yeah you see i'm not seeing this what the stars before brad's post hey hey is what's before brad's post uh, you see what Brutal girl, the attack she cops from middle aged men is ethical bankrupt. Oh, sorry, goodness, right. I think you're talking about Greta Thunberg, is that correct? <laughs> sorry, I don't what Brad was saying. Um, oh, before Brad's post, was that on the uh, oh, you'll have to refresh my memory again. Sorry, Greta, <laughs> that's okay. Um, I think. The attack she caught from Middle East men is ethically bankrupt. Yeah, um, I, I I wouldn't call her a poor little girl. I think she can take it rightly. Um, Brad, I think she can dish it out. That's what I like about her. Um, I like people with attitude. <laughs> and uh, Greta, Th if I'm saying her name right, Greta Thunberg has, has got attitude in spades. She's, um, yeah, she's a good role model to young people, I think. Hmm. Are you set to live chat or top chat? Uh, well, that's what I thought was part of the problem I've, um, because it was on top chat. I have it set to live chat. Ether, does that make a difference? Or would it be better with top chat? I'm a wee bit ignorant in terms of the difference. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Greta, Greta Thunberg. I, that's what I said. It's, um, it's interesting. June is very relevant ecologically these days. Um, hmm. and I don't I don't know what you think about Frank's message within okay I'll try it again thanks Ether do apologize uh, yeah it happens a wee bit sometimes just the thread gets lost or something but I'm, I'm, what you were saying was I couldn't see a comment I don't think before that but then I kind of figured out we were talking about what who the poor little girl that Brad was <laughs> talking about I always need context I think guys but um but there we go. So yeah, if anybody has any questions or comments about the whole ecological thing, um, um, I think it, it's an interesting presentation engine. And the, the only thing I really don't understand about it really is why it why it pitters off, if you like, why it peters off and dies a death really with the with the destruction of Arrakis. Um, and Frank's ecological message is fundamentally linked to the Fremen. And I think we mentioned one of the other nights there that the, the Fremen are used by different groups on many, many different levels. I suppose the Guild use them, the Planetologists use them, you know, um, the Atreides use them, the Bene Gesserit use them, um, and all of all of this kind of all of these kind of system, systemic thinking. I suppose that orientate onto people who also are systemic thinkers, as we will see that, that the idea that the Fremen. Are not sophisticated it's nonsense their, their their level of sophistication in their technology to deal with their environments incredible um but it's it's about it's about developing systems that work in symbiosis i suppose ether says i've taught technology art oriented at university for 10 years and now i teach english as a second second language i've taught adults and children around the world i taught chinese before the ccp excellent and you teach japanese students as well ether yeah <coughs> temple temple of course yeah i thought about doing one of them but I, I never ended up traveling that much i ended up just kind of I'm, I'm one of these people that's just kind of perpetually went back to university and hopped around different jobs to to pay for my my, my education really um i just thought i always always consistently get bored and go back and learn some more which, which is one of the things a bit hateful about doing a terminus degree i suppose that 
um, unless there's opportunities to open up, you're kind of done educationally wise, and it's going to be a sidestep or do something whenever you're whenever you're you're older. CCP banned foreign teachers in August. I hope they begin teaching Korean or Japanese students soon. Ah, right. Hmm. That's interesting. The, one of the local universities here has a, a, a with a reasonably large, I'd say, Chinese student population. There's a language department in there, I think, called the CELT. And I think they're well set up and connected within, um, you know, the good good flow of uh, students within the, that university sphere. And uh, I wonder how that would affect them, actually. Ban foreign teachers in August. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, China. China's not... You know, authoritarian. It's just a yeah, it's a bizarre place at the moment these days. I think you know, don't blame the people. It's just the gov form of government as always. Um, is there a lot of similarity between Japanese and Korean and uh, Chinese ether? I imagine. What, what, wonder what that group. I don't know too much about the linguistic groups in that part of the world, but I um, imagine that there, are they, you know, a bit like the Celtic languages from the same. Goodness, I must look that up. Uh, uh, yeah, quite like languages. Love, love, love the handwriting of, um, mm, you know, the Eastern cultures. Um, I, I particularly love Korean writing. Korean writing looks so beautiful as a script. I absolutely adore it. Uh, I'm quite absolutely, I quite happily have pictures of Korean writing about my house. I just there's something, um, something quite nice about it. That, mm, not sure if you're familiar with the CCP is doing. I love Chinese people. Hate the CCP. Uh, that's the Chinese Communist Party, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, I'm the only high school dropout. <laughs> oh, I'm a high school dropout. Uh, well, I didn't, I didn't finish school too well either. <laughs> uh, the gentleman there, so uh, we're all in good company. Mm. As I, I did all right once I got out of the school. Um, went and got what I wanted, but school school was not a good place. No. Many many schools for me, constantly moving. Uh, so that's school at fifteen. Brad, does that count? Yeah, well, there you go. So um, yeah. Um, <laughs> mm. <sighs> I hung around in school till I was about eighteen, but I I, I had been working since I was ten. So <laughs> so. Um, I think, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of didn't head off to with all the other people from school and stuff. Went went off and did a, a tech course at the local college, and uh, didn't do too well in my A levels. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and then managed to get myself going into into university. The way I went, you know. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting where your life takes you, isn't it? And ed education doesn't you know, in terms of how you educate yourself. Um, you know, uh, both I suppose both both the women in my family are not educated because that wouldn't have been a thing. You know, I'll be my mother and my grandmother. Um, both of them can read and write. Both of them are very were very smart and uh, educated themselves. Um, you know, uh, very well. Pardon me. I have a great job. At Ethers, my grandfather dropped out at sixth grade and went on the. On the create the largest on to create the largest bicycle chain on the east coast of America. Very good. Uh, hello, David. David Segovia it says hello, sir. One question: We have to think about ecology in June through the terraformation of Arrakis. Yes, we do. Um, uh, and that process, as we see, um, the the first thing is that Arrakis is not originally a desert planet, so it's had its entire ecology changed by one invasive species uh, which is the sandworm and we're told that it's um uh, the sandworm is simply an introduced vector and we don't know where it comes from but it's certainly how, how the life cycle of of the sandworms work in terms of water so yeah absolutely david the the first of all arrakis is not originally a, de a desert planet so you know um the desertification of the planet itself is a pointer um, the ecological dream of the planetologists, Pardo, it, and um, later on his son, Late. It's really Pardo's dream 
and it's about really him going this entire planet is my my sand pit um because of the existing myths that the Bene Gesserit of so now they're he's able to kind of get get his ideas into the um, into the fremen and use them as geomorphic agents and a lot of this david is in if you read the appendix appendix one of june is the little mini adventure of Pardo Kynes, and you'll, you'll get a full sense of how he manipulates the Fremen, why he's manipulating the Fremen, and to what end. Um, so, um, hmm. so the dream then is to start altering the the the, the ecology of the planet to, to make it an Eden-like world, um, and it, it's not really in a sense to re return. I think Arrakis right, to what it was because I think we don't get a. A sense of truly what the planet was like, though the investigations of Pardo kinds reveal that there were seas and oceans, etc. Um, so then, I suppose it goes through many forms. But yeah, the, the the ecology of the changes to the ecology of Arrakis happen really fast and much much faster than is intended on the I suppose the ecological time scale. Um, we get different different characters throughout the series being indicators as to the change that's happening. And so the change that's begun slowly under Pardo and then carried forth under Leid, once Paul's in the Emperor, it kind of super accelerates in a way, up to the point where whenever we see Leto II and Ganema as uh, young adults and, and investigating the desert, they're starting to see the damage that what's being done is doing to the worms. And of course, the worms are fundamentally linked to the, the ecology of the planet. And at that point, Leto II decides to accelerate this and we move this, this plan up to where we get to God Emperor of June, which isn't brilliantly fresh in my memory, as we recall. But at that point, um, I think there's only a very small section of desert left called the Sarir, and that's where the remaining worms are. Ultimately, wherever that's going, and of course, we get the God Emperor going back in to the River Idaho and all the worms coming back back to Arrakis, but the planet's ultimately destroyed. And the Arrakis, I suppose one of the things we always have to remember is that the Fremen are fundamentally linked to the planet because they've, as much as they're the Zen Sunni wanders and have been going from planet to planet to planet, whenever they end up on Arrakis because of the amount of saturation of spice, they're stuck there. So that they're fundamentally tied to their planet. So absolutely, the, 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 the transformation of Arrakis is key to uh, Herbert's ecological explorations, as are the Fremen in terms of how to go about um, using people, using them as a, as in a manipulation, as geomorphic agents. So it really is the planets our educator. Um, David, I hope that answers your question, but there's an awful lot more to it. And as I said, this one's just sort of setting up the, the general introduction, um, but we really are going to pile into this in detail. I think we've got nine more episodes of this and then and then pretty much the overall conclusions and we're done. So I hope that's a good answer to your question, David, and thanks for joining us, by the way. Um, I'll just catch up with people here. Ether says, I was in the gifted class at school, which means I have a 130 plus IQ. When they got rid of the gifted class, I lost interest in school because I was learning 10 times outside of school than I did inside it. <coughs> Excuse me. So there we go. So, so honestly, I felt betrayed by American education. If only I knew how to generally become teaching little racism with this bullshit CRT. Um, yeah, edu education is often, I mean, we see it within the, the June universe education, propaganda, all sorts of things. Um, the, the, what I, you were asking me about uh, just before we were talking about that, we were asking about what different things that I teach and, and why I can't teach RE, even though I have an extremely good knowledge of that is that the, the religious education program here is geared towards the sectarian situation in Northern Ireland. So they don't actually teach about any other religions except the three Abrahamic ones. Um, I, I, you know, and it's, it's kind of sort of self-referencing. It doesn't really give a good um, idea of different, you know, religions and cultures around the world, which is sad. So there's a lot of education is geared to sophistry, to promote an idea Sophistry is um, any argument that whose intent is to deceive. You can really call that propaganda, you know. Um, it's a bit like pe you know political parties, pe people talking about, oh, you can't read this book in school, you can't discuss this subject. Um, you know, anytime somebody says you can't do something, you always, first thing that comes into your mind should be why. Um, hmm. 
but it's very very sad um as i said in my uh, here they're getting rid of um the novel at, at a level so that that'll be the level just before you would go to university and uh, kids who are studying english literature won't be studying a novel because it's too difficult to study a novel mm. You know, I've I've taught plenty of kids novels. You know, and they don't have any bother reading them. It's it's the person who's setting this idea. They're the person who has a bother reading novels. I think, but it's sad, and it's one of those interesting things you're talking about American education, either, but especially with June, is that I'm quite aware that June is on an awful lot of kind of literary courses um, in America, university courses, and it pops up in all sorts of places. It does. My understanding is it turns up and ecological courses, courses about politics, literary courses, sci-fi courses, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's it's a book that's kind of, I, my understanding is it's a book that's studied quite well in the United States. Yeah, but you wouldn't see anything like that on a literature curriculum here. On topic, though, Frank Herbert taught me how important tying in the ecological expression of genetics is on people's cultures and ideas. It has helped me to imagine what a human would look like on we go. Hang on, I'll wait for you to catch up with your typing there, either. I know it's a, such a constructive thing, these 200 character things, you know. Um, well, he taught me a lot of lessons about um, ecology, I suppose. Uh, let me just run that thread together then. There. On topic, though, Frank Herbert taught me how important tying in the ecological expression of genetics is on people's culture and ideas. It has helped me to imagine what a human would look like if they evolved on a planet with low gravity or high gravity. That alone would change a civilization both genetically and socially, politically, yeah, in all sorts of ways. Um, we're fundamentally altered by our, you know, we, we, we live within our own environments. And it, um, you know, it, it does, I suppose that I'm one of those people that, you know, I'm from Northern Ireland, it rains here all the time. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and we don't get a lot of a lot of heat, I suppose. Um, and I suppose, you know, just the, the, the way I, I suppose I don't look like anybody in my family at all. Um, a lot of a lot of Irish people are quite dark with dark eyes, I would say, dark hair and dark eyes, and that would be the, and quite small. <laughs> and I would say that'd be the, the, the same for the pretty much almost everybody in my family. The the only ones that don't, for example, my grandmother would have been six foot tall. And have blue eyes, uh, and I'm over six feet and have blue eyes. But everybody else in my family's wee, and, you know, nothing has to do with the environment. But, uh, um, but yeah, Carl Sagan, one of his books, I think, is possibly the Cosmic Connection. Or it might be in Cosmos, looks at examples of creatures that might exist on other planets, such as um, Jovian type planets, you know, gas planets and stuff. It's really interesting. And um, Ian Banks's Algebraist. Um, kind of explores a bunch of different cultures that are symbiotic in a way that uh, living living on gas giants and in, in, in a book called the algebraist if i didn't mention it already <coughs> let me just catch up folks excuse me hello 160 160 says i'm in the hospital for kidney stones spaced out on spice i will watch one of your videos now to fall asleep as i often do i hope you're getting better 160 uh kidney stones aren't funny are they but uh uh yeah spaced out i hope you're yeah i hope everything's mellow um and you're saying love the vids and if you have more planned i look forward to them i see nearly all of them well certainly we're working away working at one today uh still writing it very very tricky thing to write so i'm still working on the video on the pelopids in june and, and the the associative greek myths that overlay the entreaties and uh, at, at your guys request and boy have i give myself a hard a hard job there it's not a hard job it's just a, a, a very busy job it's a lot to cover um, Bob says, uh, let me just check, when environment is almost as important as genetics for evolution, it would make sense to understand how it can be manipulated. Mm. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, and thanks for your answer. Oh, David says, thanks for your answer. Can you re recommend us some other stuff related to ecology and sand dunes? Um, I, I certainly will. Um, if you give me a wee second, I'll, I'll scribble a couple of things down in my head. Um, David, I'll run a few books from you there's a full bibliography on all of this stuff at the back of the last episode by the way um and the next episode david's going to run through a lot of the ecological works that are contemporary to frank herbert's um june series and contemporary to the ecological thinking that's coming out of the late 50s through the 60s and into the 70s so that we'll, we'll have an awful lot of that stuff in tomorrow night's episode actually 
and we'll, we'll be having a wee look at each of the different books too and uh, not in massive detail but it's it's again to kind of fill out your knowledge of frank herbert's understanding of ecology more than more than anybody else's i suppose um so you're more than welcome any more questions david fire them away questions help me here <laughs> i'm 160 saying hi to everybody uh, so yeah genuinely i hope you're feeling better 160 uh, say hi to everybody in the hospital uh, Ethan says, yes, Babs is an author who's writing a grand space opera. It really altered my point of view on civilization. Yeah. There's a game called Spore, isn't there? A computer game. That's a really interesting little thing. I've just played it a couple of times, but I, I know it was kind of, you evolve a creature and, and the whole thing is about evolution. Mm. Let me see. David, in terms of your question, books on, um, give me one wee second. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Books on ecology. Um, the most important one, I think. Now, this is an old book. It's not that old. I keep thinking things are old. That's me. It's getting old. Uh, and am I am I wearing the right glasses? I am. Okay. <laughs> Let me see. Um, just to get a year of publication. First published in 1973. Uh, and I just want to get the author's name correct. I can't remember. Well, E. e. Schumacher. This is this is a really good book. I highly if you're interested in ecology. Um, this book was listed as one. I think possibly the Times or Independent newspaper, one of the British newspapers, the one of the hundred most important books of the twentieth century, and it's called Small is Beautiful, and it has a wonderful um, subtitle. Uh, I don't know if you can read. It. It's in red. It's a bit of chromatic aberration here. But it says a study of economics as if people mattered, and this is a really interesting book on um, on ecology and the problem with economics and the idea of Buddhist economics is particularly interesting. It's a very, very, very good book. I highly recommend it. Um, I'd also, if you're looking for, um, let me see, in terms of Frank Herbert, the influence is on him. In particular, one. Um, there's one ecological writer that's a major influence on Frank, and that's Paul Bigelow Sears is his name. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. Now, Paul Bigelow Sears has two books that are a big influence on Frank, and one is called Deserts on the March, and the other one is Where There is Life. And I think it's called An Introduction to Ecology. I'm not sure if I ha have this book here. It should be around somewhere. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. But as I said, guys, I don't like running off and looking for books in case I can't I can't find them. Uh, I'm not seeing it anywhere handy. But uh, hello. Oh, here, tell you what, folks. Happy days. Praise the Lord and all that stuff. Oh, my love, my sweet. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy. Ah, something really nice has happened. Um, well, hi. About a month and a half ago, I lost my wedding ring, and I actually thought it was absolutely gone. My wife has just found it. I don't know. There you go. Can you see that? It's a very unusual ring. And I'm not joking. My wife is I'm, just, I'm so happy. And it slips off my finger a wee bit. Sometimes my finger gets really narrow, and I, I, I think what I did was I just did that, and I went... Whew, uh, <laughs> and I thought it had gone under the bin or something. Sorry, I'm absolutely delighted. There's my wedding ring, and like that's my guitar finger. When I'm playing guitar, it goes on there and it stays there. So, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm over the moon. I've been really gutted that I lost that, and I don't really have much. I'm not into jewelry or anything. Sorry, folks, I got that was my wife just finding out there. That's really nice, and I'm really chuffed. Sorry, <laughs> let's get back to your questions. I got distracted there. That's a good distraction. I'm really, I'm really chuffed about that. Thanks, love. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, good luck with the um, with the uh, book, Ether. Um, if you ever want anyone to re review it for you when it's finished, let me know. Send me a copy, and I'll happily have a read at it. One sixty is saying I'm feeling way too good. Well, I'm I'm feeling way too good with you. One sixty. Uh, <laughs> 
is it one of those where you get to push the button and deliver more drugs in the hospital? Is it like that? Are you are you in control of the button? Ether, <laughs> I'm sorry, 160. Um, Ether Prime says, I'm kind of a Quentin Tarantino fanboy in a way, but how I approach my world building is more significantly influenced by Frank Herbert than Quentin. My dialogue, however, comes more from Tarantino's school of thought. I just think Quentin Tarantino's school of thought is that it's natural dialogue. I would, it's a bit like good storytelling, but it seems, that they, I think it's the attempt to make it very natural. And it's a thing that, I think it's just, um, as much as we all think, and I like Quentin Tarantino a lot, don't get me wrong here, what I'm about to say is, Quentin Tarantino is very good at dialogue, but it's just, I think, a lot of other people have gotten very bad at it. Does that make sense? And that's why his work stands out, particularly in that in that mood, I think, that we we like that, that snazzy dialogue there, but it's actually quite naturalistic and quite realistic. And because it works, it's very funny, I think. it's. But yeah, there's, there's something... Uh, yeah. World building is quite an interesting thing. Mythopoeia. Um, uh, to do, I got to love it when you get the opportunities. I actually heard of that book a few times. Do, 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 do. <coughs> oh, sorry, folks. I, I, yes. Um, congrats and th happy days, and that's nice. Thank you. Sorry, I was, I was, I was asked to run through some of the ecological books there. I do apologize. So we had Small is Beautiful, which um is a really good read, by the way. And I, you know, I'm not an ecologist or anything like that, but I, you know, excellent book. Um, Deserts on the March in particular, and I said, Where There's Life by Paul Bigelow Sears. Um, that's the, I'd say that's those are the books that are a major influence, um, David. And there is an, we were talking about this, interestingly enough as well, we were, we were asking where does Frank Herbert get his ideas? Where did he find Samuel Butler? And we kind of assumed that because Frank Herbert read a lot of kind of that kind of Victorian, kind of early turn of the century literature, that was in his youth that that was probably when he went read butler but if you look at um i think it's where there's life and it is where there's life and an introduction to ecology um if you look up at the back in the index you'll find samuel butler there uh oh is it you pronounce it as a long i i th a long a athier it's like that but it's Greek, isn't it? <laughs> so you got to pronounce every letter, ether, ether, <laughs> ether. I would go with the e, ether, east, Aeschylus. No, is he? I'm trying to think of A's. That's my rule in Greek, as I understand it, ethers. I always pronounce every every letter. But if you check, sorry, folks. Um, uh, the the interesting, really interesting thing is that um, Paul Bigelow Sears talks about Samuel Butler's Erewhon in Where There Is Life. And that's the book that heavily influences Frank Herbert's ideas on ecology. And there's a, a connection between, you know, uh, Frank Herbert, Samuel Butler, and Paul Samuel Butler's Erewhon, June, and Paul Bigelow Sears is where there is life. So there's a few others there, but Rachel Carson's um, book in particular. And uh, as I said, uh, I don't have too many of them handy. But we'll have a there's a reasonable chunk of these kind of works, and then also David responses to June as well as an ecological work. We're going to see some of that. Um, Athier, Aether, Aether. Trying to think of um, God, isn't it like uh, oh goodness, you should see the names I'm re re reading uh, for this uh, Pelopids in June. Um, <laughs> You want to hear a couple of them? I'm just rattling off the Greek. Where are we? Uh, and I, let's see who have we got here apart from Tantalus, Proteus, Pelops. We've got Eurythemista, Euryanassa, Pactolus, Xanthus, Amphidamantes. <laughs> uh, some cracking names here. We've got Salmonius, Sisyphus, the Danaids. Uh, there you go, just a few of the interesting names coming your way if you're interested in June, folks. I'll tell you something, by the way, folks. I I, I was, um, something I hadn't thought about, and, and, and it pinged in my head today. We were talking about the Greek myths, and it was all to do with Leto. And it's not in my, I, I, I think I knew this stuff, but I think I cut it out because of length. But if you look at the, the, the associations of Leto, um, Leto in particular is associated with um, 
So Leto in Greek mythology is the mother of Artemis and Apollo, who, if we know our syzygies and our representation, are Paul and Alia. And, um, of course, Leto being the father of Paul in the Dune series, Leto is another one of those name gender inversions because Leto is a, uh, the name of the, the, the mother of um, Apollo and um, Artemis. So it's to do with the Tantalus myth, which is to do with the Pelopids. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, and you might not know this one, so this is all to do with June as well. And it's to do with, I don't know if you've ever heard of Niobe. And Niobe is the daughter of Tantalus. Mm. And she has 14 children. They're called the Niobids. And seven are boys and seven are girls. And the story is, and if you think about this in terms of Leto, Paul, and Alia, and what eventually happens in the universe, the story goes that Niobe, who's the daughter of Tantalus, says that, um, she, you know, look at me, I've had 14 kids, aren't I amazing? Leto can only have two, even though they're gods. And so that's an act of hubris, which means the gods are, she's doomed the minute she says that, pretty much. And so Leto hates this, the, father, the mother of uh, Artemis and Apollo, and so she sends her two children to slaughter all the children of Niobe. So Apollo shoots all of the men with his bow. And um, I can't mind what Artemis, probably does the same thing. Artemis slaughters all the, all the women. Uh, there's a version that one of them survives. And um, in the story, that's, that's what Leto does. She sends her two children out and slaughters all the children of this woman. And her husband is so appalled, he commit, he kills himself. And the story about Niobe, if you, the, the two words that you associate with Niobe are all tears. And so the, 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 abs, the absolute nature of her misery at that point, some versions of the story, she turns to stone, but the tears keep going. Uh, and the other versions of the story, she returns home to her father, uh, Tantalus, where the gods, kind of just enough of the misery, set her in stone, but the tears keep running. <clears throat> and just in case you're thinking about Leto and his two children, Paul and um, Alia, and you know, sending them out into the universe, and they're 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 you know, it's it's an interesting week. They're little subtle connections. So there you go. That I just thought that was a really good one, and because uh, I was looking into stuff to do with the different, uh, I was looking into stuff to do with the Pelopid story. Has a all about feeding Pelops uh, in a. Basically, sort of in a in a food of the gods type pie to the gods, <laughs> and it's a it's a it's a parallel to another story from Greek mythology to do with the fifty sons of Lycaon, um, which is where the word where you get the word lycanthrope from, which is the word for werewolf, and this is another one where this guy's got fifty sons and forty nine of them decide to feed the other one to Zeus, <laughs> so it's a kind of he turns them all into wolves, I think, so it's just a just while we were having a wee quick chat about that, it was just something that's popped into my head there when I was researching this next video. Uh, it might end up being quite a long one, folks. So that's why you haven't seen it yet. But I'm, I'm still working on it and uh, still writing it. And once it's once it's done, I'll get it recorded and filmed as quickly as I can for you. But I think I think it's a really interesting one. It's, it's opened up all sorts of, oh, that myth too. You know, um, finding me things I didn't notice. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. So it's an IV, so continuous space, <laughs> says 160. Um, I put this word long before I learned the AU is pronounced as the ether. Um, hang on, ether, sorry. Uh, what am I thinking of? Isn't that the fifth element? Aristotle's fifth element is the ether, isn't it? Or, uh, yeah, it's the fifth element, uh, is what ether is. I believe, if I'm remembering rightly. Um, so 160 was saying, uh, well, 160 is recovering uh, in a hospital. It's an IV, so continuous space, no button for extra. Oh, that's sad. Said I had pain while I was little, so it's a second dose on top. I'm basically on a rack. <laughs> Excellent, 160. Ether Prime says, by the way, I would absolutely be honoured if you'd be willing to be a beta reader for my stuff. Oh, I'd be, be delighted. I'm always, uh, always happy to read something. Uh, David says thanks for the recommendations. Never heard about Paul Bigelow Sears. Looks interesting. Yeah, he's a, he's a big player at the time, David. And um, Sears's work's really based on, um, I suppose, if you look what happens, particularly in America, um, 
during the well, you know, the various events that kind of lead to the Dust Bowl. It's, it's all to do with the use of you know combine harvesters and stuff and the massive overproduction of wheat in America. Um, so particularly deserts on the on the march, this stuff is it, it's kind of coming off the back of the Dust Bowl period, which. Um, my understanding is lasts a full decade in 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 the in America that there's three three major sort of major periods of it. I've seen seen newsreels and stuff of the Dust Bowl, and it's kind of impressive and quite apocalyptic looking. Um, so, uh, and again, Herbert's work really is was it was started on June was to do with his he was going to write a journalistic article about barrier grasses in Oregon. So, and we'll see that coming up as well. Well, actually, there's a wee episode about. The genesis of that article if you see what i mean um so yeah paul bigelow sears it's again his book's really kind of meant to be a general introduction so my understanding is pretty popular pretty well known at the, uh around the time we'll say in the 50s i think i'm not too sure on the date i'll dig these books up for you for tomorrow night actually so we can have a wee nosy at them but you can you can also have a wee look up look them up yourself so my understanding is paul bigelow sears is pretty well known in the in the environmental world, if you like, within publishing and so on back then. <coughs> but um, the, the connection to Frank Herbert is uh, absolute. I think we have him talking about Sears a few times, possibly, as well. Uh, but um, Ethan says, especially knowing that I'm writing this as an inversion of the June story in many ways, and in others a response. Well, that's great, Ether. I mean, we were talking about that, that um, there are responses to June. And some of them are, eh, it's this and it's that. And they're, you're actually going to see this in the next episode because a lot of people, when they respond to June, only look at the first book, which is absolutely, depending on the time they made their studies, I suppose. But if you don't look any further within the June series, sorry, um, then you've made an absolutely critical mistake in your studies. Um, it's hard to look at anything in the June series without looking at least... To the first three books but if we want to and, and that was the thing really with this that whenever i was doing this work wasn't as much as people don't want to go near the first book because of its size it, to do the whole series is the only real way that you can approach frank herbert's ideas in these books because if you don't you're not actually finding out what he's about they're, they're long-term lessons and part of that part of those lessons is teaching you about long-term thinking and that your long-term thinking isn't nearly long-term enough <laughs> So you know what I mean, um, but yeah, I've read I've read both books. Um, being a uh, having done a PhD on June, I suppose I'd argue I know a lot about deserts uh, <laughs> as well, though I've never been to one. Um, excuse me, I'm going to be sip of cough medicine here. Mm. I think that's enough cough medicine for now. <clears throat> if you want to be drinking that? I'll be feeling feeling like one sixty. I'm not. So there we go. But certainly, yeah. As I said, we're just kind of setting out our stall with this episode. So if you do have any questions about um, the, the ecological idea, um, we're sort of giving you just a sense of it at the moment. As I said, we can all see, I suppose we're all in different countries, where, you're, where your sense of the ecological, the nature of the catastrophe, if you like, where you're at in your individual countries. Um, you know, because, you know, the, the, the climate in some places, the, you know, the, the micro environments that we have, microclimates, sorry, you know, I mean, a lot of America has been on fire, Canada, Russia, you know, the, the heat problem in Europe has been quite bad this, this year. And uh, even Northern Ireland, we are, our water supply is nearly dried up in this, in the heat, this, which would be quite impressive with the amount of rain that we have. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of lessons to, and I said so we have we'll actually see next in the next episode some of these um, long-term attempts to to analyze the nature of the ecological disaster you'll note you'll note that some of them if you check things like the Club of Rome report and stuff like that you'll note some of these things are kind of still going on or have have operated um, since then uh, 160 says go listen to it see you guys next time have a good one take it easy 160 I hope you're out of hospital soon all the best um, Ether says, in my lore, magic is real and technology is far, far advanced to ours today. Angels are known as ethers, and while I am loosely basing it on the Hebrew Kabbalah and other ancient pantheons. Ah, hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Old Testament's a good read for, for, for uh, 
sort of Jewish Hebrew mythology, if you like, stuff like that. I quite like it. Um, but you know what? I actually saw something the other day, but it was it was an article about Judaic representation, I think, in the Dune series. Let's see. Brad says, Jello, Biafra, and Mojo Nixon did an album together. One of the songs is called Burgers of Wrath. <laughs> It's about the Rust Bowl, obviously intended the parallel grapes of wrath. Ah, I see. Yeah, well, John Steinbeck's your 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 Dust Bowl writer, isn't he? Really, um, Dust Bowl chronicler of mice and men's a Dust Bowl book. Um, Ether Prime says I was born in Massachusetts and grew up in Florida. I really must get a map of the world up here on my wall. Um, but my my American geography is really poor. Uh, kind of know some places. That, uh, <laughs> I suppose it's just what we get from TV, but uh, I was born in Massachusetts and grew up in Florida. I know where Florida is. I'm trying to figure out Boston, Massachusetts, isn't it? Ah, got it. And I've traveled the world. Now I reside in the Philippines. The view of ecology is directly connected to how close one lives to a city. Pardon me. Brad, Brad saying fires everywhere. Welcome to Planet Australia. Mm. We do get fires here um, as well, actually, but they're, they're what you would call gorse fires. And um, they're pretty much kind of 50 50, either catching fire because of the, the natural background heat, or a lot of them are started um, deliberately by farmers. Um, the Northern Ireland's got a fair amount of gorse, I suppose, but particularly up in Belfast, the, the heat um, down at the Bourne Mountains, you'll see these things catch fire. Hmm. But as I said, sometimes it's natural, and sometimes it's the farmers, you know. <coughs> hmm. Yeah, Fall River. Oh, we're going to have a look. Let's see Boston. Boston's. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, it's a Massachusetts. That's the Bee Gees, isn't it? That's great. I love cultural. It's in Bristol City, Massachusetts. Oh, it looks nice. Down, down Fall River. Tenth largest city in the state. Doo -doo -doo. Ah, there's a map. There we go. map of the yeah. ah right yes all right that's quite far up on the east coast isn't it hmm. never been to america <laughs> absolutely gorgeous hmm. i'm i'm up around what the sort of northeast coast I, I lived all over the place but the northeast coast of northern ireland and kind of all around that and um what you would call the glens of antrim leading up to the Giants Causeway and then uh, uh, to the Antrim Coast if you want to call it that have a look at that and um, things like yeah the Giants Causeway is just there and uh, what do you call it uh, things like the Dark Hedges but yeah it's very green and hilly here in Ireland and the tree and stuff but we're getting a lot of coastal erosion at the minute it's increasing and in, uh, I think Ireland's got about 5 per but 10% of its original tree population, maybe 5% actually, I think. Very, 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 it used to be a very foresty kind of place once upon a time. Uh, I travelled all around the USA before leaving. Yeah, it must be great to live in a country that size, isn't it? I mean, it's it's just enormous. Ethan Prime says, my Texas, Georgia, Kentucky, Colorado, California, and a few others. Ah, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if you know a few places here. I can tell you a few places that I have lived in. And um, I've, I've lived in a place, well, let me see, I grew up in certain places, but I grew up in a place called Larne and another place called Carrick Fergus, which is um, where you'll see the a fantastic, if you look up Carrick Fergus Castle, you'll see what I mean. And um, yeah, just around that part of it. Uh, not been there for a long time, but those are kind of the, the kind of big, um, I suppose, the, Norman Carrick Fergus Castle is, I think, the oldest Norman castle in Ireland, and it's in one piece. Not that I wish to encourage tourism here, but if you ever are here, it's worth going to see, you know. You okay? That's all there. Excuse me, a wee second. I think that's just me. I was looking for ah, that as well. There you go. You're all right. So, <laughs> There we go. We're just all having chats about where we're where we're from or where we've been about. So there we go, folks. Let's see. So yeah, I suppose that you all guys probably know around where I'm from from all the Game of Thrones stuff. I suppose that's been on TV. Hmm. 
I think Hellboy 2. I'll give hell if you watch Hellboy 2, I'll give you an idea where we're at. <laughs> but yeah. Hmm. But yeah, so I don't know what you think. Um how much of these you know, how much the world's in, is it in a terrible state of crisis, I suppose, or uh that's one of those things that a lot of people, you know, the world's kind of fallen into two camps. We deny that there's an ecological change or you know, environmental problems, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But um I suppose I'm 48 now, and I've, I've been around long enough to actually have noticed the changes, I think. Uh, the one thing I learned is that most people live in claustrophobic cities, but if you ever visit these places outside of a city, you really cannot grasp how large the world is. Yeah, I suppose. And I think for most of us, our worlds are quite small, aren't they, Ether? Um, but uh, I, I've lived in a lot of big cities. So I've, I've lived in London. Um, I've lived in Liverpool, which is uh, one of the big, and I've lived in Edinburgh. I lived in Belfast, uh, which isn't massive, but it's big enough, I suppose. Um, I'm trying to think of where else. I lived in Paris for a while, but don't like big cities at all. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think I was t I was chatting to you about London the other day and how bad the water is, but particularly how bad the air is. And if you you come from a place, when I was a student in London, I used to go home to my parents, uh, their house had its own spring water, you know, natural mountain spring. And I'd just go nuts. Just the first thing I'd go in, grab a drink of water, go, oh, my goodness, oh. And it's just the best tasting stuff ever, you know. Uh, so there we go. But it's, it's yeah, I think a lot of cities are going to have to try and start becoming kind of garden cities. But the, the development of mega cities, as you say, some people's ecological attitudes are kind of tied to how close they live to a city or whether they live in it. Um, Northern Ireland cities are arguably large, quite large towns, I think. You know, Belfast is, I suppose, a proper city, but all all the rest of the cities aren't really what you guys would call a city at all. <laughs> you know, uh, Brad says, the way I see it, when economics is more important than quality of life and the environment, we are setting up for a fall. Thinking of kinky sex makes the world go round by the dead Kennedys. <laughs> You're still on the dead Kennedys, Brad. I'm going to have to listen. I'm going to have to have a dead Kennedys night, Brad. Uh, just to dig out under is it Franken Christ on cassette? Uh, it's on cassette, would you believe? <laughs> would you believe somewhere? Um, but yes, I, I do like my dead Kennedys. Yeah, uh, economics is more important than the quality of life. It, it, it's a fundamental flaw, and he, you know. Economists aren't shouldn't be running the world. Simple as that. I think it's one of those interesting things, you know. Julian Simon says, loving your series so far. Keep it up. Thank you very much, Julian. Welcome to the show or to the chat or whatever it is. To <laughs> welcome to the doghouse, the space station. Um, if you've got any questions at all, Julian on, on ecology tonight's episode is just setting up. Setting up the stall and looking at the ecological themes, and they're, they're going to include systemic thinking, hydraulic despotism as well, which is uh, we're seeing that a fair bit at the minute as well. Um, you know, so if you've got any questions, Julian, far away, or any comments at all, science fiction, June, ecology, all things, all things, June and June science fiction. David says, Thanks for the recommendations. By the way, do you have other websites related to June? I'll check all your videos here. Um, I don't at the minute. Um, no, David, I've just kind of just been doing this sort of since COVID, to be honest. I'm, I'm a total amateur here. Um, so I, I have actually bought a domain name, and I'm thinking on getting a website sorted. But um, uh, not, not as yet, but I'm thinking I'm trying to create a wee website to tie in certain things um, to the science fiction station. Things like I had a copy of... Um, the June Encyclopedia and stuff, and kind of emailing it to people. But I'd like to have a wee place where I can put up documents because you can't make. Um, I'd love to be able to actually provide you guys with a lot more info that I have, but I can't through the medium of YouTube. So um, I've I've bought a domain name, and we'll get around to getting a wee website done, and we'll get some of the, some of the stuff that I have up up there for you. Is actually because I've 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 accumulated a lot of interesting stuff over the years, particularly on science fiction. I do have a lot of it on electronic format. Excuse me. <clears throat> so not at the minute, David. But I'm, I'm more. I'm, I'm kind of get a lot of requests for stuff. But even doing the doing a normal video takes about a week. So uh, working away at it. But we'll get there. So hopefully, 
but I, I would like that to, to be able to say things, you know, certain documents and stuff that I have to make them available to. Now, the best I can do is take, a, you know, if it's a book, I can't, there's nothing I could do. I couldn't photograph that, you know. Dean says, uh, Belfast is the best blend of city and town. I think. Uh, hello, Dean, how's it going? I was, I don't mean to apologize to you, Dean, because a lot of your comments the other night, I wasn't figuring out what you were talking about, and they were coming. I was only catching them a, a few times after the effect. So I was get, I was, I looked at the episodes, by the way, again, once they're done, Dean. So I do apologize, but I, I know you were getting them, and I wasn't quite catching what you were saying as you were commenting, you know. But uh, totally got what you're saying about my car crash. Totally got what you're saying about nightfall, and it reminded me of Northern Ireland. So just wanted to say that to you. <laughs> uh, there we go. Um, Julian says hello to you. And June was the first book that made me that made really open my love of science fiction. Mm. I think it opens a lot of doors to a lot of people. Uh, Ditto, Julian is the single best channel on YouTube about this. Oh, thank you, Ether. <laughs> channel Mao says you drink water from the ground. I like my wa London water like I like my philosophy, filtered through as many other people as possible before reaching me. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't want to say it, but if you've been drinking water in London, it's it has passed through many, many people. Yes, filtered by a uh, sweet, yeah, you know, a uh, chilled mountain brook. Absolutely pure. Oh, it's so beautiful. Uh, love the water here. Somebody's trying to get us to start paying for our water here. I think that'll go down like a ton of bricks. Where are you drink water from the ground? Yeah, uh, I taught web design for two years at uni. <laughs> or ten years. Oh, God, I taught it for a few years, too. Get to see the review for Planet June. I caught the trailer, guys, by the way. I caught, <laughs> I caught the trailer. Where can you? Where is that coming out on DVD or anything? I don't know where you can see it. I'm sure it's not going to get a cinema, but I had a, good, I had a look at it uh, last night, and... Uh, I'm thinking we ought to get you to watch it for the first time. Like I'd, I'd love to do that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to watch that. By the way, I love. We've been discussing this. I love good bad films. So it might be a bad bad film, but uh, who knows? But yeah, I, I absolutely love B movies. Joseph Smith says hello. I'm late, but here, hi Joseph. Either from web design, two D, three D art. Yeah, uh, Demon Kent's the nature of the base with the comments. Not worried, Dean. Just I wanted to explain to you because I. Sometimes I do lose the thro the, the the thread, if you see what I mean. But yeah, nightfall uh, it reminds you of Northern Ireland, doesn't it? <laughs> Once a year, there we go. It's an interesting thing. But... I was saying hello. Well, folks, I'm out. It says Babs, got to do the dinner. Be well. We all deserve you to moan it. Yes, indeed, we do, Babs. Take it easy and look after yourself. All the best, Babs. Take care. So there we go, folks. So if anybody else, a few other people have just joined us, um, we just sort of do this every night after the wee episodes on, on the, the June series. And we are hitting the ecological theme. And I think, yeah, the, probably of all of them. Well, I still think the hero theme is really relevant. The dangerous hero, the dangerous politician, the dangerous religious figure. But, um, yeah, the ecological thing, theme, I think. I'm hoping, this is one of the things I'm hoping for, that the, the film gets to deliver this message correctly. You know, Julian says, okay, do you think that the worms are the only truly alien species in the Dune universe, but also somewhat silicon-based? Um, the, the worms are a plant-animal species. They're, they're a hybrid, and we don't know who makes them or how they're created. Julian, but the, uh, my work's based only on the original six Frank Herbert books. So I don't know if that's been kind of answered by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. Um, are they the only true alien species in the Dune universe? Depends what you mean by truly alien, but I'd, I'd argue that everyone in the Dune universe is not a baseline human. But I don't know. I'm trying to think. Uh, certainly in terms of the animals, the other animals that are on Arrakis, Julian, they're all... Um, desert specialist animals that are transplanted there from Earth. So I'm not 100% sure. Um, the question, here's here's the good point. I have, I have a wee bit of a theory about this, but I'm not too sure. Where do the worms come from? What are the worms? And if they're a plant-animal hybrid, we can assume that they're possibly created out of some kind of genetic engineering, possibly in a lab. But the, the one animal species that the worm resembles most is the lamprey. 
and as we're, as we're getting along, you'll see we we actually have a comparison to in the videos as we're getting there, um, a comparison of the lamprey's life cycle and how it operates with the life cycle of the worm, and there's a lot of similarities. So not too sure about um, where does the idea is that worms are animal plant hybrid turn up? It doesn't ring any bells with me. Uh, right, okay, bear with me, and I'll find out. It's in June somewhere. <laughs> But uh, let me see, first of all, let's, I'll tell you what, I'll have a wee look, Dean, see what we can find. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Uh, would I be better to search my, my PhD rather than June, because it'll tell me in my PhD. Let's have a look. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Bear with me a wee second, folks, I'll have a wee quick look. Uh... Oh, hang on. We're up to the... Bear with me a wee second. Um, mm -hmm. Worms. Where's the worms? Right, let me see. I've got a couple of references here. Um, uh, did many plant species become extinct after the arrival of sand trout and plant? Those few that survived and later transplanted were excellently adapted to survive in such a harsh environment. With so few plants on the rank, the question arises to where the near-perfect oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide mix comes from. Right, on we go. The mystery is the worms. Right, okay, that's all about attempting to capture and transplant. Oh my go. Sorry, bear with me a wee second. I'm not too sure at the minute, guys. Uh, tell you what. Um, hmm. Have I got my PhD here? I know where it is. It's probably, there's definitely a reference to it. In terms of um, doing basically the work that was done on the... Um, on the sandworms is in one diagram and it meant a massive chunk of stuff removed but we do have an episode on on the the life cycle of the worm and it's referenced in there so it's from in order to do that i was just having a quick run through through june there Dean. in order to actually get the full life cycle of the worm it's it's revealed through it's you're never given one it's just there you have to read all six books um, and actively look for it. Um, everything that I got is pieced together out of the six books. So I'll have a wee look for it. I don't have it handy, but um, there'll be a reference, and all of the, all of this stuff is referenced. So it'll be a specific page number in a. But if you look at the video, actually, um, have a look at the video on the worms. It's probably in there. But if not, we'll get there and we'll 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 find that. But they are they're an animal plant hybrid. Um, I wonder is that actually just in June itself? Within the, let's have a wee look. Sandworm. Bear with me one wee second, folks. Sorry. Oh, but I wonder what it says under under sandworm. <laughs> what would it be? Sandworm. Do it, sand master. Shy halud. Let's see. No, I thought there would have been an, ent an entry there on the worm. Uh, unless it's shy, shy halud, but no. I'll have a wee look and see what I can find, folks, but uh, there is a definite reference to it. Uh, but I'm not sure. The bridge of worms. No, can't see it there, just offhand. Sorry about that, folks. Um, but they are, they're a plant animal species. Um, mm. oh goodness sake there you go <laughs> I should pay attention more I'm sitting buried in a book, in a book. Um, Dean's got the half plant half animal deep sand vector of the arachis oh is that my reference Dean <laughs> thank you very much number 18 or maybe it's not um, but yeah half plant half animal vector of the worm 
So uh, I suppose the question is, where do they come from? Um, who, who brings them to the planet and what's the point of them? But they seem to be something geared at being dis, you know, destructive environmentally, I suppose. Let's have a wee just catch up, folks. But um, it's, it's coming up, actually. So <laughs> do you think, oh, but, 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 but oh, yeah, I don't know about. And so the question then, I suppose, where we were to, went there, Julian, was that does it make them alien? I, I suspect that the worms are from Earth. And um, at the point where I'm at within the Dune series, I only know that Earth's mentioned only once in it, and we don't know what happened to Earth. So part of it's just about the mystery of the worms. Um, there we go. Brad says, you don't see a great deal of hydraulic despotism in film, but definitely the BBEG from Mad Max Fury Road is there. Uh, the BBEG. Can you expand that acronym for me, Brad? <laughs> but, oh, yeah, well, um, hydraulic despotism is definitely in Mad Max Fury Road. It's the, the control of water, the control of uh, guzzling. Um, hmm. Julian says, I said they could be silicon based because they also eat the sand and produce oxygen. The only way to do that would be to process the silicon away from silica in large quantities. <coughs> Excuse me, Julian, I think there is something to do with silica with the, the worms. I'd have to have a wee look into it, but I, I get what you're saying, and it's quite possible. Um, I said, I'm kind of coming back fresh to this stuff. so it will be, hopefully things like that will be covered, but um, I'll have a wee invest a wee, a bit of an investigation into that and see what we can find out. As long as it doesn't mean having to read all six books again just to figure out if they're, if they're made of sil or if they're a silicate life form. Brad says the worms having to eat their own younger form doesn't make sense to me. It's a sustainable system itself. Sure, it needs an energy input to continue, but I don't get where it comes from. Yeah, the the answers. It's, it's um, of course, by the whole point of me, I can't, guys, I suppose, are trying to figure out the full life cycle of the worms and where do they come from and all of that. So we're not told. Um, it's, it's, and I could well have been, for, you know, it's seventh book mystery, if you see what I mean. But we were talking about the stuff that's set up in June at the beginning and uh, stuff that just doesn't have any payoff or, or probably would have had payoff in the seventh June book. I, I think the mystery of the worms. He's giving us enough and he's keeping keeps running with that throughout the six books. So I think he would have still had something to, to maybe surprise us with there, you know? Uh, having to eat their, their own young. I suppose a lot of species would do that. Think about the Fremen water's water, meat's meat, you know? <laughs> Ether says, okay, so I actually have a question. Why does Frank Herbert introduce no humanoid aliens in the Dune series? All of the race's species are presented as offshoots of humanity. Yeah. <coughs> I think it's um I think it I think each path of evolution is meant to be slightly alien to us. And that there's we have this idea of science fiction at the heart of science fiction, this sense of cognitive estrangement. Something that we recognize about ourselves in it, but something that we're slightly uh, distanced from. So we have all of the, almost every group within June, as much as they're human, they're not the same genetically, even because if they live on different planets, that would inv that environment would alter them. So I think it, I think it personally, I think it would detract from the exploration of human evolution. If we suddenly had a bunch of aliens turning up and going, because we're we're always kind of interested in aliens and science fiction because they're alien. If you see what I mean, something different. Ah, look at these cool aliens. What are they like? You know. Um, so, I think that's probably it. All of the species are of humans are kind of a divergent form of Homo sapien. Some more so than others, um, and I suppose that. The changes to humanity aren't always represented as, you know, they're, they're not necessarily all physical changes, but more about control of physicality and mentality. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think uh, I think it's really, it would, I think it would distract, and he's got enough going on, I think. But the evolution thread is the strongest all the way through the series. Um, so, yeah, I, personally, I think it would just, we'd, we'd be, it would just, uh, it would distract us from something that's quite complex already, you know. 
uh, you know, maybe to maintain focus on the offshoots of human evolution without distraction, just to get. Yeah, I, I kind of think so. It's a busy set of books, and um, they're head. There's something they're heading somewhere with the seventh book, but you know, uh, I wonder if it isn't something deeper. Says Ether. What if humans are the first advanced species in the universe in millions of years from now? There are many. I think somebody <laughs> presented that you could have a cyclical conclusion to the end of the Dune series. Where is it? What do they call the ship? Ethica, which is a loaded name. Um, Ethica is very loaded as a name for the new ship. Is the, is the ship called Ethica in the last book? I'm wondering. Big bad evil guy. Thank you, bro. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's kind of, or definitely the big bad evil guy from Mad Max Fury Road is there. Yeah, Morton Joe. Hmm. Very much so. Very, uh, very much a kind of. Almost a, a very similar figure to the God Emperor, isn't he? Hmm. An interesting contrast, Dean says, between Dune and the Hyperion Cantos is while they both depict human galactic civilization post a scattering of sorts, in the Cantos, Old Earth looms large in collective memory. Ah. Both depict human That's absolutely it's the oysters. It's just it's been a long time since I read um, Hyperion. I'm really looking forward to reading it again. I'm going to do some programs on it. Uh, Dean, they're cracking books. And I'm I'm a big fan of Dan Simmons. Um, yeah, it's an interesting con contrast. Yeah, um, both human civilizations have a return of the, from a scattering, if you like. Um, Old Earth looms large in a collective memory. What I really like is, I suppose, what we get a wee bit of Old Earth in, in, in the Hyperion Cantos, Dean, is Martin Solanus' is quite wonderful sort of memories of it as he, as he tells his story on the way to, to Hyperion. Um, there's a really funny bit in that where he loses the ability to speak except for nine words. Um, it's it's uh, where he, he comes up with this great philosophy philosophical idea. I, I think if you know what I'm talking about, Dean, and he tries to explain it, to all the people around him using only these nine words, and they're the most kind of basic, you know, like they're mama, pee pee, shit, piss, <laughs> this kind of thing. And there's a bit in the book where he just goes, shit, shit, blah, blah, blah mama, pee pee, pee pee, you know, poo poo, blah, blah, blah. And, and they all look at him and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, I don't want to swear too much, basically, because of the nine words that he has. But um, it's a very, very, it's one of, my, one of the things that made me laugh the hardest ever, ever in any science fiction book. I think I laughed harder when I read that than anything in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And don't, don't get me wrong, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy made me laugh a lot, but he's an extremely good writer. Mm. Yeah. Julian Simon says, thanks for the answer. And yeah, I agree they're humanoid or the humanoid or alien to what we would call a baseline human. Yeah. Um, hmm. What are the Fatars? Oh God, I'm trying to remember that. Is that some kind of genetic thing created by the, oh, oh, created by the the honored mattress, Fatars. I might be mixing that up. Oh, why? Well, they're um. I just had a wee quick nosy, but I forgot about them there. They're, they're um, women combined with feline DNA to kind of create some kind of fighting thing, I believe. Um, so they're, they're, uh, they're some kind of, I must have a look at them again. I, I think that's going to be uh, down the road whenever we get back to the um, the Bene Gesserit book. So I'm not really, uh, that's not really fresh in my mind either, but that's, I did a wee quick search and that's what it says they are. Um, hmm. So another another one of these strange combinations or genetic combinations. Do do do. Let's see. That's one of the answers to the Fermi paradox. What's that? What are the what are the for that? Oh. I wonder if is it something deeper. What if humans are first advanced species in the universe and millions of years from now there are many? I was putting forward the idea, guys, that humans aren't built for this universe as much as we think we are. But there's other species that um, that are built for this universe. Maybe 
maybe evolutionary speaking will not get there but we could help them get there that's that's kind of rather non human i suppose non androcentric kind of point of view <laughs> uh let's catch up with you so this is one of the answers the fermi paradox we're the first ah arguably i'd say is it to do with the fact that everybody in the universe has been all everything's been evolving for the same length of time so if there are other civilizations out there arguably they should be around where we're at and that's i think a reasonable answer to the fermi paradox isn't it in june earth is a faded memory <laughs> uh, i love isaac arthur caught a couple of his videos recently yeah there's one, one I actually didn't get around to watching all, but I want to go back and have a look at it. Photographer from the Benny Tilex who went into the scattering human feline hybrid uh, hunt for the honored matters. Ah, thank you. Yeah. So, like cat women, she woman, cat type things. <laughs> um, Joseph Smith are the nine words you can't say on TV. Uh, no, I'm, I'm trying to remember what they are. They're, they're, they're mama and papa, shit and piss. I think, fuck, cunt. Pee pee poo poo and something else. Literally, that that's them. But uh, I would have to, I would I'd, I'd happily um, happily read the passage to you sometime actually give it proper context. But otherwise, Joseph, it would just seem like I would be having some kind of rant um, fit or something. <laughs> you know, some foul mouth rant. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe maybe dig it up for you. But it, it is the one of the funniest funniest pa passages ever in a book. I think it's really good. It's he, Martin Salenis is the poet in, in the Hyperion Cantos, and he believes that it's kind of the the Shrike, the monster on the, on the planet Hyperion, he believes is his own creation from his poems. So uh, his, his particular nightmare there is a kind of a solipsistic one, which is quite, which I think is quite interesting. Not many books on multi-person solipsism. <laughs> I love saying that. Pan-dimensional multi-person solipsism. Not that Hyperion is, but that would be Heinlein's uh, number of the beast. Uh, let's just catch up, folks. Do -do -do. Let's see. The honored mantras tamed some, but they were originally designed to hunt them. Uh -huh. My favorite books. I was just curious if you had any additional insights to what they were and why Frank Herbert introduced them since they're the only non-humans. Uh, well, they're, 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 again, they'd be humans mixed with another type of DNA, I suppose, who come uh, just as alien as everything else, you know. I do it yet. Yeah, anyway, George Carlin, a man before us. I love George Carlin, a very good, very, very astute comedian. Uh, he's Rufus, isn't he, in the Bell and Ted? That's, that's how I was introduced to George Carlin, by the way, because I wouldn't have seen him on, on British TV, I don't think. But uh, I got introduced to him through Bill and Ted. Uh, yeah, he's great. I, well, he's, I think he's passed away, hasn't he, sadly? But uh, George Carlin was excellent. So there we go, folks. Um, we'll run up to just short of midnight. So we've got about 25 minutes, if, if that's okay with you guys. So if anybody has any other questions, um, fire them away. As usual, we're within June. We're all over the place. And we are setting up a wee bit of a, as I said, setting up the ecological approach that Her Herbert has. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's very, very much a part of who he is and, and uh, I think his concerns about the world. And um, I think he ended up, uh, wasn't he able to buy a, a, a Hawaiian, I think he did he have a, a small island in Hawaii or some sort of property in Hawaii. Potizer introduces the only non human species in June. Hmm. Did the honored mattress make them? They eat the, yeah, they eat the Bene Gesserit. Yeah. What is it? There's, is there dog chairs and stuff like that as well? There's some unusual genetic mucking around in the June universe. Do, 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 do. Grimdark Elven Lord Master. Came a little late, just got home from a Renaissance fair. Hi, Grimdark. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> People must all have much more interesting lives than I do. I went to a Renaissance fair if I got smacked in the face by one around here. <laughs> uh, there we go. Thanks for joining us, Grimdark. If you've got any questions or anything on the, the I said we're just starting the setup of the ecological theme tonight. And um, otherwise, it's all things June and science fiction as usual. We had a bit about what you can't say on TV. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, there we go. Renaissance Fair. The Renaissance is the rebirth. Uh, big fan of the Renaissance. Let me just see if I do have any of those. Uh, I don't think they're handy. But I've always got something or other to, to have a wee nosy at. Clubs of the Elfin Moon. Let's see. No, I think I'll bring up some of these ecological books tomorrow. Uh, but, not, but not, I don't see any there. Oh, I think did I show you to, to the level of, to the dedication of research I went to to study distrance. There's a good wee book for you. Echoes of bats, man. <laughs> ah, dear, oh dear. So I end up buying all sorts whenever, all sorts of wee books when reading June, just to check things out. Yeah. There we go. Every time I think of a dog chair, dog chairs are so weird. They're always mentioned in passing, except for Myers Tegg's distaste for what the fuck. It's literally a chair that kind of walks along and sits down. It's kind of, as far as I know, engineered out of a, out of a dog, but it's a chair. <laughs> if I remember correctly, every time I think of a dog chair, I think of something like the naked painted women in the squid game for the VIPs. I won't, I haven't got there yet either. Um, I've only just watched the first episode of Squid Game last night. Uh, hmm. So just, just on the episode two. <laughs> yeah, spoiler warning, everybody. So, yeah, I'm not too sure what you mean. But, um, yeah, sort of here. Well, like animal furniture, basically, isn't it, I believe? You know, excuse me a second. Hmm. There we go. Hmm. Having a wee quick puff there. <laughs> Should really with this cough. Mm. Damn it, it's good. Kind of those things remind me there was a, a long time ago there was a 2000 AD story, guys, and it was kind of like um, a bit like these kind of things, uh, possibly a little bit Starship Troopers y. As about they pick a thousand men as to, to see who's going to become one of their top Starfighter pilots. And uh, the statistic that they, they bounty around is that uh, only one in a thousand is good enough. So it starts off with a thousand of these guys, and they're all, they're all training to be starfighter pilots. It's just a wee simple comic story. And suddenly all this alert goes off, you know, and uh, they'll get out of your beds, you maggots, and all this. And uh, it says that they tell them all that there's the, the bad guys have taken this point in the hell, and they all have to go and fight and try and stop them. And they've only got their, like, pajamas and stuff on. They all charge there. And they're all shot to bits as they try to get up the hill. And, you know, one by one, all thousand of them go down. One last guy, one guy gets in there. And he's, where are you, dirty alien scum? You know, and there's no aliens there. And I think it's all the brass going, congratulations, son, you're our pilot. And, uh, of course, they'll go, well I, well, I don't understand. He goes, yeah, the one quality we need in a starfighter pilot, luck. You're the one guy that didn't get shot by all these turrets. And, <laughs> you're, that's, and that's how they pick him. Um, just seeing all the guys get shot. Of course, everybody else in the story has been stunned. I thought it was kind of funny. But yeah, a lot of people are getting shot. Uh, if the honor matches were ever adapted, would easily be an R rating for a heretics film. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they'll, be, they'll be pretty. I, I, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of sexual exploration in the last two books of June that would probably crank up the, crank up the uh, certificate, <laughs> if you see what I mean. We're also talking away, by the way, guys, I'd lost my wedding ring to, uh, a while back and my wife found it during the show and I'm so happy. So, so happy. So that was going to be thing that happened. <laughs> Let's just catch up here. So it's one of here. Da -da -da -da. Oh, Dean, have you, have you not read the, the, um, Oh, the, sorry, that's about Squid Game. Dean, Dean, I'm doing it again, catching up. Check it out. I just watched the first one last night. Oh, everybody, I've got to tell you, absolutely, by the way. Listen, if any of you have Amazon Prime, Hard to Be a God is on Amazon Prime for free. Go watch it. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's it's uh, the movie, Alexei German's movie version of the Strugatsky Brothers' Hard to Be a God novel. Um, the book is incredible. Hi, Orion. Um, the book is incredible. The film is unbelievable. I um, just love it, but highly recommend if, if you haven't seen this film. If you know the book, even better. You'll love it. You'll love the film. You'll go, oh, how brilliant is this? If you don't know the book, it's going to be really strange for you, but you're going to, ah, it's, it's amazing. 
but I highly recommend it. I just noticed that um, we've watched it once before me and the, my wife, and uh, just incredible film. It's, it's black and white, by the way. But um, just sorry, just reminded me, folks. There, check it out if you haven't seen it. But yeah, I've start, started watching Squid Game. Uh, we we just watched a Korean show that was a kind of like a mad. Well, oh, what was it called, Wendy? What was the name of that Korean show about the teeth, the priest? The fiery priest. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I don't know if you've seen Father Ted, but it kind of kind of was like Father Ted with mad action or something. But I quite we quite liked it. Um, <laughs> oh, we're we're hitting the topics here. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Just bagged up a wee bit there, but yeah. Sorry, I just just it just reminded me. I wanted to say to any science fiction fans there, um, if you haven't seen Hard to Be a God, it's an incredible movie. Um, let's see. Do do do. There's no way to keep the last two books rated as anything but R without cheesing it badly. Yeah, and I also think that Frank Herbert writes sex scenes quite badly, guys. I don't know what you think, but there's, I'm sure I seem to recall a string of pink sausages turning up in one of his one of his sexy scenes. That I just I just went, what what's he on here? <laughs> Joseph Smith tobacco R because my insurance tobacco laws. Oh, tobacco in this country, Joseph. Uh, don't want to get, you know, uh, shot, crucified, murdered, etc. <laughs> uh, Ether Prime says, hello, Ryan. Joseph Smith. Oh, I'm going to say hi to Ryan there. So sexual exploration started in God Emperor of June. The fish speakers engaged in practices that offended Duncan. <laughs> uh, Ether says, I have Apple TV, but not Amazon. And I, I suppose that's the problem, isn't it, for a lot of these things that for these days within the global market, Ether is we have Netflix and, and um, Amazon Prime, and that's it. So, for example, as much as I'd love to be looking at taking a look at the foundation, not going to happen unless I go back to my Pirate Bay days. Pirate Bay days. But um, <laughs> just can't be bothered with all of that stuff anymore. <laughs> you got to praise that woman like you should. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, let's see, Foundation's pretty good, uh, either. Is it? Is it like the book? I'm kind of curious. I, I know young Quinn does have done a few videos on it, and I think it's not quite orientating towards <coughs> a very very much, I think, Asimov's. I, well, I got that sense from him, actually, but I um, can't watch it, so I'm kind of, and I'm kind of sort of watching Quinn's videos about it, so that I might skip it, because I'm kind of not wanting it spoiled, if you see what I mean. I'm, just trying to get his sense of it because um, I know he's a big fans of the, big fan of the books, um, and I only know the three original um, Foundation books, so I know that the other ones, are, and I think the red one of them is a prequel. So I have honestly no idea. Um, I remember we we while back that was it MTV did a Shannara show, and um, I quite like those books way way back, Terry Brooks. But the, I mean the original ones, and I think I don't know what it was. It didn't. Certainly didn't look like any kind of Shannara book that I remembered in my own head, you know. It, was, it looked appalling. Do 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 let's just have a look. Foundation. So yeah, I'm wondering what the TV show's like. I think we can one of many reasons Duncan doesn't like homosexual. Yeah. The homosexual nature of the Duncan's pretty much presented as old fashioned in his sexual attitudes, isn't he? Um Check it and see if we can find it on the high seas, says he's a prime. Duncan and Marbella will always be one of the most awkward sex scenes I ever. Is that the one with the pink sausages, Grim Dark? Because there's there's a sex scene in one of those books. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to look it up, but it's the it's ridiculous. It's, I just remember a string of sausages or something. I just went, what? Really? You know, and you know they, they do don't they have um, awards and stuff for for people who write really bad sex scenes and stuff these days? I think. Um, I'm sure there is awards, rewards, or awards for, <laughs> but I wonder is that the sex scene? I'm thinking, uh, or Master Frank was homophobic, the trouble relationship with his gay son was known. I've, I've talked a wee bit about this, Dean. I'm not sure if I would call it homophobia and, and what and how we look at homophobia. Um, I suppose we people would look back at Frank and say, Well, he's not got very progressive ideas on homosexuality, if you like. But a, a homophobia, homophobia, that kind of irrational fear that leads to hatred and that kind of thing. 
I I think Herbert has a problem with homosexuality, but he looked at it as a genetic one. And I think he looks at a lot of things in the, those kind of clear terms, if you see what I mean. Uh, I think he saw it as an incorrectly as an evolutionary dead end. And I think that, more than anything, informed Herbert's attitudes about homosexuality. But um, I, I don't think he was homophobic in that sense. Um, and he did have a... A reasonably troubled relationship with uh, Bruce, his son, and um, and Brian. Uh, so you get the sense that the family relationship's not brilliant there with the children. But my understanding is that it, it's a thing that they work out. Herbert's attitudes evolve just like they do in the books, to be honest. And uh, my understanding is that I think he, he patched things up with his son. And uh, I'm pretty sure if you have a look at Brian Herbert's book, um, is it dreamer of june i i think things can you think you know people change or can change you know so a lot of the times it's a bit like people saying well something to do with the we've heard a lot of general comments about science fiction from the 60s from some of the june cast you know um uh, badly informed is all i'd say poorly educated on the subject um mm. so um basically and, and homosexuality as an exploration of sex and gender. I said, we're, my, my work is missing two chapters at the end. And you'll see, I talk about them in the final episode, by the way, but the exploration of sex and gender is part of these intertwined themes. It's really important. Homosexuality as much as a part of heterosexuality and everything else, you know, pretty much is, that. I suppose, we have a range of different things there. So, and, and it's an exploratory to say that Herbert's attitudes are the attitudes of the 50s and 60s, remember we say June series, it begins to write it in the 50s, and we're done in the 80s. That's covering a long period of time. Um, so it, it's just my own opinion, but it's not. I wouldn't call it homophobia in that, that sense. Um, maybe some people would think that that is homophobia, but I would disagree um, based on simply translate the word. Um, that's, I tend to take particularly words like that literally in their greek meaning or their original meaning if you like um or latin well, depending on what it is you know <coughs> dude so i'll just catch up folks uh let's see here we go where frank not accepted as gay son bruce but duncan's views on homosexuals as you can see from in universe yes uh and um doesn't like the books but that is only because foundation has very few characters yeah it's the, it's the, it's that's i was wondering about that either it's um Character you know, is not strong in those books, but they are, and they're a great idea. But you're thoroughly enjoying it. Ah, good. Well, that's it. Is it good entertainment? Uh, Dean says, Grimm Eleanor, isn't there a conversation between Duncan and Ma about Maneo, which his doc just said was as if Duncan was old fashioned man, even though he 30, oh, even thought he was 30,000, even thought he 30,000 in, in our future. And had the sausages of pigs. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find that. I, I swear there's a... I, I actually promised, guys, that in my little A to Z of science fiction, that I am going to do a program on sex in science fiction. Uh, because there's all sorts of quite interesting things to look at there. But we'll definitely, definitely include the sex scene from June that has the sausages in that episode. I think that would be fun. Chapter House, thank you, thank you. It's you're calling them the sausages of pain. I've got to look that up, but I, I'm not wrong. Am I? It's got sausage. It's sausages, isn't it, Grimdark? See the things that you can remember from the June series and the things that you can't. The little tiny details, but that's something I'm not likely to forget in a hurry. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Did I miss? I think Karen. Karen, I popped in. Oh, I'm bit, boy, I'm late. What did I miss? Hello, Karen. I I think I've run down a wee bit. Let me just. Back up a wee bit to make sure I haven't missed anybody's comments here. Foundation series takes plenty of liberties from how much I saw, says Carol. Ah, okay, I like the books, but that's okay. On we go, catching up, thoroughly enjoying it. Do do do, chapter high, sausages of pain, <laughs> sausages of pain, like a house of pain song or something. <laughs> the sausages of pain are in the house. <laughs> Travis Price says, Hey there, happy to be back. Hi, Travis. Uh, yeah, there's a scene in God Emperor where Duncan scorns into fish speaker love. <laughs> this must be fish speaker love. <laughs> I think it's a dead end as well. 
Uh, those came up, but you can't deny that everyone was gay. The human race would cease to exist in one generation. Not necessarily so. Uh, uh, have a look at uh, see that's uh, that's the thing. I, it's not a genetic data. And uh, uh, speaking of genetic dead ends, me and the girls here, what you call the end of the line club, but um, no, it, it's 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 uh, have a look at Richard Dawkins and what he talks about memes and how the genes of other people can help other genes. I think that's point you that way, either. Um, arguably, everybody, you know, <laughs> what's the point of genetics at all? What's the point of evolution? Uh, where, where is the ultimate end point, you know? Pardon me. As a red-blooded heterosexual male, I would never discover to get into, pardon me, women who love sex with other women, especially if they're having sex with me. <laughs> Are you a lesbian in a man's body, Ethan? <laughs> is the old joke, isn't it? I do my best not, not to discriminate in any way at all. I, I'm really, everybody's different. I'm, to be honest with you, it's your differences that make you interesting. I think there's a big problem with human society is that we, we kind of grow up thinking that we should all be like other people. And the, the best thing is to be yourself, I suppose. It's the end of the line about refusing to procreate. It's a genetic dead end, I suppose. Uh, yes, not refusing, no. It's a little bit like the, the interesting times game. And I'm the only human member. <laughs> All the other members are dogs. Well, sorry, arguably we're all dogs, I suppose, if you think of me as a cynic. Uh, Frank Herbert wasn't conflating Baron Harkonnen's paedophilia with homosexuality. No, I don't think so. Um, I think it's just a, it's a layer to the Baron. Um, it's, uh, the Baron is a paedophile and he's a homosexual. They're, they're, they're two different things, but he happens to be both of them, I think. Uh, um, yeah. But his paedophilia as homosexual is not just focused on Paul, I think. Uh, Ethan Prime says, in my understanding of women, 90% of women are naturally bisexual. I have never met a 100% heterosexual female. I wouldn't know. I, I, Ethan, I'll put it this way. I don't go around asking people what's, uh, what their sexuality is. It's, it's one of those things I think is kind of interesting. Um. There was somebody that was introduced to me a long time ago by people from Northern Ireland, and they wanted me to, and they, they and they had to point out to me that he was gay, you know, uh, and he's gay, and I said, "Well, oh, oh, I am, uh, uh, I'm Russell, and what what do I say? Am I I say I'm a head to say why introduce somebody based on their sexuality? I think it's silly. Um, well, I don't hi, this is my name or something, or you know, uh, or, or that you know, it's just I don't know. Um, I, but I, I tend not to go around. Going, hello, what's your sexuality? <laughs> it's, it's just something that doesn't interest me at all. Um, it seems to interest quite a lot of people, I think. But I don't know why. Uh, either ever heard of an ex lottle tank? <laughs> uh, yeah, and 87.5% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Either I changed the number from last time. <laughs> Sausages of June. Ah, I have a wee sort of joke with my son that. Uh, I was going to write a children's book uh, for him a long time ago, equating um, called Lord of the Baps. <laughs> and it was to do with how much he likes sausages. My son was mad about sausages. Uh, and it was about me trying to make him eat a, a, a bat with something healthy at once. And we basically kind of went through the whole Christ thing uh, and applied him carrying a sausage. <laughs> and he was, yeah, very, very bizarre thing to do to my son. <laughs> the imagination on me, eh? Um, wouldn't he, uh, Baron actually be by being seduced by a Benny Jesuit sister? I got, I think it's in one of the Brian and Kevin ones, isn't it? But I think the implication is it's just to kind of lie back and think of KD Prime, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, but I, I think that I think he's forced, and I got the implication. I think is that from the Brian Herbert prequels that the Baron's put into a position where the, the guy is Reverend Helen Mohim has to take his seat or whatever. My understanding is that, that he rapes her, doesn't he, in those books. And my understanding is that's the point where she inflicts all her venereal diseases and stuff on because the Benny Jesuit can just go have all these have all this VD. And I think that's what happens to if I'm not mistaken. I mean I wonder if is that from the prequels. Seems to be a thing I remember for some reason. The Baron is a tricky subject. Homosexuality and 
Um, <laughs> I'll have a wee joke with you guys here about this. Uh, let me just check your spelling as well. I got a wee second. So the, the combination of uh, ah, right. Let's see. Pedophilia. Okay. <laughs> Pedophilia from Dean, pedophilia from Grimdark. Where are you? Okay, guys, it's pedophilia. Yeah, ped means your feet. Okay. <laughs> now I know this is an Australian and American thing, but you don't take Greek words and change that. Take a letter out like you do with English words in America. So I'm well aware of this that America and Australia spell the word pedophile, P-E-D. But if you think about peddling pedestrians octopodes and octopodi and octopuses and all that. That means um, that he's a lover of fate from where I'm standing. So pedo has an A in it. <laughs> Just to let you go. And it's, it's, I know it's not your spelling. That's a cultural cultural change in English. <laughs> Just thought I'd point that out. I think it's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, back to the car. I just wanted to see how everybody was spelling pedophile. What's the one in the IT crowd? I'm with Peter File. Is not the guy's name? <laughs> you, they, they announced his name at the airport. You know, last call for Peter File, and he, I'm Peter File. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Sorry. Anyway, back to the question. The barn is a tricky subject. Homosexuality and pedophilia have historically been conflated. Frank disputes it in the God Ever of June in a conversation between Duncan and Maneo, where Maneo says he didn't understand the enemy well. When Duncan associated homosexuality with him. <coughs> ah. mm. Oh, and you love it. <laughs> I think his fame would be legal age where he's 19 at the end of the first book. Well, still creepy for the Baron. Well, I think the Baron is meant to be a bit creepy, but it, again, it, 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 is it possibly a trope from old fashioned times where we used to want our villains to be obvious and to, to ap apply a number of uh, uh, negative? aspect to that villain if you like um it's done quite a bit i say it's um hmm. I understand it so uh when in doubt blame brian and kevin says <laughs> oh dear I, I was thinking about brian herbert the other day just in terms of um you know what he does i was actually thinking the, the best thing way to put brian the brian kevin the brian herbert thing to the test is um you know what was I thinking of? A book, a book, a bookie book, a bookie book. Let me see. Uh, do -do 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 -do. I was going to suggest that he wrote a book with his dad, Man of Two Worlds, it's called. And I know he gets a lot of grief for it, but I, was, I don't know if anybody, if many of you have read the book, but it might be interesting to give you a slightly different perspective on Brian um, working with his father. There it is. Oh, worth, um, I think there might be an anniversary edition of this. Um, delightful Entertainment, says The Times. And it kind of has a similar format to June, I suppose. You know, that kind of, it's a bit of a thing with, with Herbert, you know, those little introductory passages and stuff. But it, it might put him in a slightly different, he wrote this with his dad. I don't know how many of you have looked at it, but I, I think he gets an inordinate amount of grief. I'm improportionate for someone who writes, just writes stories in a universe, if you see what I mean. Uh, oh, oh uh, Ryan, the scar, you see, the scent, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but working with your father sucks hard, trust me, you would not believe the stories I could tell you, and I mean it, you just would not believe them. Um, <laughs> yeah. All these things that I have done, right? Let me just backtrack a wee bit when in doubt. But yeah, I think it's. I think. I think if we don't like the stories, that's one thing. But I think there's an awful lot of hostility towards Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. I don't know. I suppose they maybe don't really care too much, but I wouldn't know. I'd, I'd say it would hurt their feelings a fair bit. But um, yeah, it's it's just you know everybody should take a. I think a lot of people have a real hatred for him. To be honest with you, that's that's my own observation. I think that's. Not a good thing. You know, just like the work, if you like, but not the man, I suppose. Uh, look at how women act towards each other when they're not observed by men. Think, <laughs> is that like a Schrodinger's cat problem? <laughs> Think of Midsummer Night's Dream. Women generally prefer to watch things like models, fashion shows, and parents. I don't make any such assumptions about women at all, either, having been raised by two and married to an exceptional one. But um, 
the sort of women I know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> they put lie back and think of Gady Pryor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> just two more weeks until the movie release says Travis. I think it's going to be a going to be a two parter. Hmm, where are we at now? Thirteenth, twenty first here, Travis. I'm not sure what date it's coming out there, but the countdown's going. Dean says, I didn't want to put the word into Google, the word and check it. What was, wondering what word that was. Um, uh, yeah, part one of two. Yes. Uh, we're going to see. Yeah. Actually, really, part of me almost kind of wants to hang, hang on to part two, comes out and watch the two together, but I think I wouldn't be able to take the anticipation. Aqua Baby. Hello, Aqua Baby. How are you? <coughs> Everybody else just joining us. I was meant to have wrapped up by now, but we'll go on for a few more minutes yet, if you don't mind. Um, we'll just run through what, what's what's being said. Danny initially pitched the movies to the studio as a trilogy, part one, part two, and Messiah. But we need part two, Grinlet, before it's worth talking about Messiah. So I thought it was interesting because the book's divided into three. You know, and you could have got a trilogy out of June, but would have required mucho detail. But I think, no, I think the two parts suits it, actually, the right length. And as I said, I don't, I don't blame... You don't blame Brian, you blame Kevin. <laughs> as I said, it's, it's very interesting that Kevin J. Anderson works on the Slam property as well as the Jim property. And at this point, guys, you should all know about that there's a conflict there. Um, but yeah, working with your father's like, so trust me. <laughs> yeah. Looking at your own experience again, I wouldn't, but I, could, I, can't, yeah, I can't even talk to you about some of the things. Well, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, no. Well, I could actually, because I'm at the point where I don't care, but... Mm. Um, yeah, I've had a very interesting experience both as a young, very young child. Um, we'll just say in relation to the troubles, and then actually quite throughout my childhood in, in terms of father's profession, I guess. But that's all I'll say. But I like it. Let me see, just catching up. But yeah, there's a good bit about it. I suppose that's that you get that from Paul Atreides working with his dad. <laughs> Look how, how well that went for them. Um, but looking at my own experiences, Ryan says, I guess I wouldn't believe you. I'm not, not actually sure you would. <laughs> oh dear. Karen says, but I like that he feels like telling the story of Messiah is just as important as opposed to some other director who might have thought of the first novel as all that matters. I think that's really important, Caron, because otherwise you're presenting Paul. If you tell June, same as David Lynch, you present June to the public and that's all they get, then the actual wow what a great messiah paul is let's all the whole point of it's lost on its audience it's the same as if you never get past the first book you know you're meant to go uh oh uh what the heck is this you know we're all going to be and i think it's part of who for example you know how how young timothy chalamet is, i keep saying that don't i that's terribly shouldn't be doing that how timothy chalamet's audience and fan base if you like how how they'll react to to the character you know, it's because he has to. We need that kind of level of char charisma in a young actor to play Paul Atreides. We need to build up that mystique around him, make him so likable, make him so supportable, and then bang, you know, and that the bang comes in June Messiah. So I, 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 I'm, I'm very pleased that I think if, if all things go well for the film that Danny Villeneuve wants to make, June Messiah, I think June Messiah is a very, very tight book. Um, very filmable, very, very. As there's a lot going on, and it. it's, it's it's intrigue. It's it's got you know it's got elements of intrigue. There's action. There's all sorts going on there. It's very, very tight. And of course, then if you did that, then let's get on to children. You know, <laughs> let me just catch up with you folks. Uh, Ether Prime says, I don't want to brag, but I did, dated a Playboy model and I met hundreds of women over the years. I was kind of a stud when I was young. And the large majority of women I've met are bisexual. Ah, there you go. Ether and I was in London in the 90s at the height of the AIDS scare. So we, <laughs> uh, at one point, the, 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 the halls of residence where I was at because the university didn't allow students to have condom or no condom machines or anything like that. Um, pretty much all, there was one incident where almost everybody had to go tested. And it, it made out a lot of people crap themselves, I have to say. Different time. Um, but no, I was not so promiscuous in my youth. <laughs> but well done, you. <laughs> Some of us have got to be, I suppose. Dean says, no spoilers from those who have seen it. In the trailer, we see Paul fighting with the Fede King, which seems like the Battle of Ara King. This has to be a vision, right? Um, yeah, I would imagine there's a bunch of things that we see in the film that are going to be visions. Um, 
a few things I definitely thought were ah to do with and even things to do with the jihad I think Dean <coughs> excuse me so the fish speakers seem 100% realistic to me ah uh, Carol says in the in this first I had to build the foundation of the world there are so many elements that you need to understand but those elements are there now that means the second one can be pure cinematic joy it will be much more dynamic I'll say this will look like an appetizer of the main meal will be part two that's the truth. It sounds pretentious, but it's true. Is that Denise's words there, Carol? Thank you very much. <coughs> Timmy's fans will have a rude awakening. Yeah, I think they, if we get to see the proper Paul Atreides, yeah. And I said that character will remain sympathetic. Though, I, I, I get people asking about this. Well, what do we think about Paul Lido turning away from the path? This game? It's, it's about you. What do you think about it? And uh, um, always in June, it's about you, the reader. And oh, um, um, I suppose that's the interesting thing about Paul and Lido. And we were talking about this is that we can always justify their heroism, and regardless of that, we should not. I think no matter what, you can't if you apply logic and and actually compassion and human decency to what they do. It's all pointless, and it doesn't make any sense. And to slaughter hordes of people throughout history. To narrow these fields. it's an excuse and i suppose the point of what frank is asking us this is my own opinion because just having a look at what frank says and what he's trying to do is what do you think why why do you support these people what justification can you give why do you follow them because you will come up with one and i think that's the point we shouldn't we can admire them up until a point but uh you know the the atreides are not nice people they're and you know depends on what you think of violence and slaughtering almost people on thousands of words, you know, for a battle at the end of time. Not a particular place, but a time, you know. <laughs> a chromachia or something like that. But yeah, that sounds good, Karen. I think, yeah, and, and you need to do the world building, I think, in the first film. It's it's the same kind of thing as Lord of the Rings. There is a, there is a detailed world there. The more he fleshes it out, I think it would always be a risk of that kind of thing the length of film, always trying to flesh these things out without losing the story, without losing the momentum that it has, you know. And you're running the family business together with your father. Well, I hope it goes well. <laughs> oh, my dad's just enjoying his retirement. If you're watching, Dad, how are you? <laughs> Hello. Uh, Dean McKenna. Yes, Dean McKenna. A lot of things they show in the trailer are pretty weird choices to use in a trailer. I will, I will say one thing. The ornithopters don't look like ornithopters. Um, they look like insects to me. They look like dragonflies or something like that, but they don't They don't fly like birds as far as I can see. Eight more days for us. Dean McKenna. Eight to, oh, I'm around to the, Yeah. Nice. Chalice says Travis. Yeah, Carol's seen it a good few times. <laughs> Pardon me. I would just say avoid looking at any more trailers if you're planning to go see the movie already. Anyway, laughing at Luke, because in the newest ones, they show some things that they just should not, in my opinion. Mm. Fourth dimensional trolley problem, Doc. <laughs> that again, dude. <laughs> oh, dear. Um... Yeah, I, I'll tell you what, guys. I've stopped looking. I know, I know. There's a few sort of uh, YouTube shows that show, you know, every little clip, clip for TV, for everything, and it's 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 getting. Uh, I've I hit saturation point with it a few days back, and started to go. Yeah, um, you're going to show me more and more little things that, you know. I think that somebody said they're going to try and put together a trailer. I'm not even sure if that's true, but um. Um, it's getting to the point where no, no, don't want to, don't want to see any more clip verts, uh, unless it's something particularly funny for, with a particular cultural twist on it, you know. Um, mm, fourth dimensional trolley problem. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think of what you mean by that. Actually, my brain is farting away today. I'm having what you call a brain fart. Fourth dimensional. Hey, we talked about this the other day. Going to trolley. Whatever that is. No, am I looking something up? Uh, <laughs> Dean McKay. 
Dean, am I looking something up? That's, <laughs> I can't really see him, but I'm not getting the gist. Kill billions now to save humanity. Oh, the trolley. Is that the trolley problem? You're on the trolley and there's... Do you, is that the one I'm thinking of? The moral conundrum where you, you, you can choose to get off or stay on? That kind of thing. But kill, kill billions now to save humanity at the end of time. Um, yes, I, I, that's the one. So it was the fourth one. Yeah, thank you, Dean. I know exactly what you're talking about now. Thanks. Uh, Ether says, my daughter just woke up. It's time for a morning kindergarten class. Can you say, hello, Katana, good luck on your first day of school? Is it your first day of school, Katana? Excellent. Well, hello, Katana, and good luck on your first day of school. I hope you have a very nice day. And I'll say hello. Hey, you is that first, first, first day of school full stop or just first day this year, I'm wondering, Ether. But otherwise, I hope you have a really good day at school, Katana. That's an interesting name, Ether. You have to tell me what it means. That's sweet. Ozzy Mandeus killed three million to prevent nuclear in Watchmen. Mm. Good, yuck, long, good luck, young lady, says Ryan the Scar. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> as much as it's nice to wish somebody's daughter have a nice day at school, we go straight to nuclear war afterwards. That's appalling. <laughs> ah, dear. But I hope Kitana has a nice day at school. Hmm. Aussie, yeah, Aussie Mandeus is a very similar kind of thing there, I think. And I think, I think there's a good bit of Frank Herbert's influence in Watchmen. Key Custodia, Ipsos Custodias, who watches The Watchmen? It's juvenile, isn't it? Satire's book seven, is it, I think. Mm. It's very loaded. Um, I love the original Watchmen. I, I didn't really like the film, and I didn't really like um, I haven't watched anything of it. I think there's a TV series now, isn't there? But I just like the original graphic novel that much, I suppose. And... Uh, yeah, but he's a he, Ozymandias, and again, he's modelled on Alexander the Great. So Ozymandias is the nickname that uh, Alexander took upon himself. It means king of heaven or king of the air in Greek, but it's, it's the nickname for Ramesses. Ramesses the second, I believe. Um, so that's the two people who in real life are Ozymandias. I think that's really good, actually, doesn't it? In, in, in Watchmen, Grimdark, uh, Ozymandias follows the route of um, Alexander the Great follows, I think, Alexander's campaigns and goes as far as geographically he can. And then, not knowing what to do with his future, he engages in a kind of, he eats a ball of hashish, doesn't he? And to try and get an oracular kind of sense of what he should do next, I think. Interesting. Do, 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 do. So, everybody's saying good. Everybody's saying, uh, have a nice day to Katana there. So Ryan saying, good luck, young lady. Grimdark saying, hope you have a good first day at school. Uh, Ryan saying, his, your daughter got her first day two months ago. Uh, Ether Prime, she is here. Very surprised to hear her name and someone talking about her on YouTube. Oh, well, there you go, Katana. And I'm, I'm over in Northern Ireland, way, way on the other side of the planet. So hello to you. Anyone played the Legacy of Cain serious games? Cain becomes a little figure, a misunderstood fateless. No, can't say I have. Maybe some other people have played them there. Behold my work and despair. My name is Ozzy Mandez, King of Kings. Look upon my work, she mighty and despair. Yeah. My name is Ozzy Mandez, King of Kings, powerful of the world. Behold my work and despair. This is the other poem you're quoting, Ryan. I don't know if you know, if anybody knows their Ozzy Mandeus. Uh, Ozzy Mandeus is a uh, the poem is a sonnet by uh, Shelley, but there's actually two poems of the same name written at the same time as a poetry competition. Mm. Um, my understanding is that I think they both went to the museum and were looking at one of the artifacts I think taken from that part of the world and. Um, Hence, the, they both agreed to write a poem. So if you actually, you'll know the really famous one by Percy Bysshe Shelley. But if you if you look into it, there's, and they're very, very similar. And, and uh, But there is another sonnet by his friend, the friend that went with him, I think, to the museum, if that's the story I can recall. 
Percy Bichani died too young. He was a complete shit, grand <laughs> an absolute shit. Um, didn't he die on a boat boating accident? I think. Um, Kane is another Eric Clone laughing. I I'd, I'd pretty much put solid money that Frankenstein is Shelley. Um, very much so. In Mary Shelley's um, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, I'd, I'd argue that Shelley is Frankenstein. Um, yeah, which says a lot, actually. Um, Frankenstein's a very interesting book. can be read from a number of different viewpoints, but it can be read from a feminist viewpoint. It can be read from a science fiction viewpoint. It can be read from a gothic horror viewpoint. But... Um, but yeah, I, I like Shelley's poetry. Yeah, and Ozymandias is. Uh, do, you, do you want to know the interesting thing about that poem, folks? Uh, I don't know if you. It's a wonderful poem, by the way. Percy so bad personally. Well, it's treatment of Mary Shelley, I'd argue. Um, yeah. Have a look at his. Have a look at his life with her, and then overlap what you know about it onto Frankenstein and what happened. What Frankenstein? Look at how Frankenstein treats women in the book. All of the women in the book are pretty much victims of Frankenstein, either his action or his inaction. But he's, he's an absolute shit, uh, if you want. <laughs> he's not an admirable character at all. Um, Frankenstein is amazing. Are you saying that Shelley is the title character is his disregard for life? Uh, so not uh, as is... Are you saying that Shelley is the character is as in his disregard for life. Um, no, I'm, I'm saying that Shelley is Frankenstein in lots of ways. Um, but uh, there's a uh, look into his death. There's something interesting about that. Uh, but yes, Shelley equals Frankenstein. That's that's pretty much. Um, his poetry was well loved by Marx and Gandhi. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite... Uh, oh, goodness, I, I haven't looked at this stuff in a long time. I believe they were married, yes. Yeah, well, of course, yes, of course they were married. Duh. See my old brain, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Ping is her name. <laughs> and Percy Bysh Percy Bysh Shelley ingratiated into her father's kind of... Uh, have a wee look at it. Look them up on... Um, look them up on Wikipedia. Uh, and have a wee look at it. And you can... There's, I'm sure there'll be an awful lot on... Um, on Shelley. Um, but, you know... Uh, but they'll have a look at the relationship in particular. And there's the night of, um, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever seen Ken Russell's Gothic. That was a good one. And uh, that's a good, that's an interesting film. Who's that? That's Julian Sands and uh, Gabriel Byrne, I think. They first had sex. Once they first had sex on Mary's grave. Crazy, really? Her mother's grave. Uh hmm. I'm going to say that would have been Percy's idea rather than hers, I think. Um, yeah, have a wee look into them, folks. I can't give you really good details because my knowledge is not that ping-ping on dates and stuff, but um, I've done a good close read of Frankenstein, and I'm well aware of it. I would teach Shelley's poetry now and then. Um, yeah, um, I'll give you a good example of the, the thing I was going to say, really. I'm, I'm going to go for another 10 minutes, folks, and then we'll call it a night, actually. But um, the, the poem... Um, Ozymandias, if if it is wrong, uh, and here's why. So they didn't actually go out to Egypt to look at this stuff. Okay, it's a it's a figment of their imagination. They're they're, they're applying imagination to to what they think they know of Ramesses, Ozymandias, and um, you know, and they go blah blah blah, and all about the you know the the shattered visage, etc., the cruel sneer, you know. And it gets basically the end of it says it all, you know. Um, to it's just look around, there's nothing here, is there? My name is Ozzy Mandez, King of Kings. Look upon my works, you mighty and despair. And around the, the sand, there's nothing. And the whole point is that's the point, it's about time bringing the mightiest of um, mightiest, mightiest of us all down. And um, <coughs> he's wrong. So go to Egypt, go to Ramesseum, and look. Because there are his name is Ozzy Mandeus, King of Kings. You can go look upon his works and despair because they're all there. <laughs> and that's the that's the thing. Um how wrong could you get it? Seriously, look up Ramesses.
go look at the city, his own city, these mega structures in the in the desert. Um, there's plenty there, and uh, the point is, I suppose, what what Shelley's saying is that there's an air. Uh, he's wrong, and as for the, all the other guys, well, where is their stuff? But as for Ozymandias, the king of kings, Ramesses the second. Was he the Ramesses the second or Ramesses the first? Sorry, um, bear with me a very quick second. I'm a bit bad with me. Ramesses the second, I think he is. Yes, it is. I, I'm not that daft, really. My old memory is not that bad. Is um, Ozymandias is Ramesses the second? Um, so if you go and have a look at the works of Ramesses the second on Wikipedia, and you'll see that you'll not be looking at a bunch of eroded gigantic structures that are in the desert. You'll actually be looking straight into their face, you know. So it's it's an interesting thing that the and if you think about if you understand what Keats says about poetry, isn't it? Beauty is truth and truth is beauty, then it makes it quite a interesting poem because it's not about the truth um at all. It's a fantasy uh from from Shelley's head. But there you go. Sorry, it's, it's one of the reasons I would, whenever I teach that poem, because it's quite a common poem on, on the, I like to show people that, that they got it completely wrong. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair, because there they are, still standing all these thousands and thousands of years after everyone else has turned to sand, I think. That's the interesting thing about that poem. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. But there you go, we've gone off on a wee bit of <laughs> so listen guys. Um if you any other any other wee questions there, just fire them away. Or we'll just sort of I'll just check that I haven't missed anything here. But was she really buried with his heart? That's a bit yeah, a bit gruesome, a bit gothic. Um and I think that the thing that's the child doesn't live as far or maybe I'm I would have to look into her biography a bit better. But um yeah, it's they're an interesting group of people, I suppose. Byron's an interesting guy, and he buried in Greece, isn't he? He's like a national hero in Greece. Oh, Byron's another one of those people that people, people at the time thought he was the devil incarnate because of his club foot, I think, or something like that. But there you go. Well, listen, folks, I'll tell you what. Uh, oh, hang on, Dean just says, always remember it being read alongside mutability. Uh. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Anybody's not read Frankenstein. I didn't come to it until quite recently, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I actually read it twice the last, pretty much back to back. Mm. I made some notes on it. Byron had those incestuous accusations with his house. Yeah, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Um, mm. I think there's something suspicious about Shelley's death, if I recall. Uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley. I think it's on on a boat only, and there's there's. I, I, I think it was possibly it was it's possible that he was attacked and killed. I think. I'm, I'm wondering where I know that from, or why do I think I know that? I must have a look at it. <laughs> but yeah, if you haven't seen um, Gothic, Ken Russell's Gothic, um, check it out. It's, uh, it's 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 about the night of the. It's about the night that there's a kind of it's a storytelling competition. It's about the night that Frankenstein, the story of Frankenstein, and is it the that's Vampire, is it by Polidori? And they all kind of write their own stories. And um, the other thing is, I suppose there's different manuscripts of Frankenstein, but Shelley's hand is in it. And um, I think it would be very, it's one of those things, put it this way. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, in cold blood, Truman Capote, and kind of his response to Harper Lee's success. Um, hmm, it was pretty, pretty not nice. And I think, um, I think Shelley wouldn't have appreciated. I think, um, I think he would have been stunned by his wife's success. Um, quite frankly, I think that uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, you know has its place in, in history in all sorts of ways as a, as a literary masterpiece. Her, Shelley's, yeah, he's all right, he's there, he's a romantic poet, but um, that's, he's not, he doesn't quite occupy the same place in, same place in literature, <coughs> excuse me, with the same gravitas, I would say, that his wife does, Mary Shelley. Um, and I love, I love a good, I love, you know, we read books, you know, that are favourites of a period of time and stuff like that. 
But I, I, regardless of a period, I like a book that's well written. And um, Frankenstein's really, really well written. It's an excellent book. So if anybody hasn't read it, it won't take you too long to get through. And it is much better than kind of, I suppose, I suppose the audio books might depend on it, but um, many, many of the versions of Frankenstein that we see on the screen aren't great. Uh, but I, I have to say, I do love young Frankenstein. <laughs> well, listen, folks, I'll wrap up for tonight. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating in your comments. It's been good crack as always. And um, tomorrow's episode then really is going to give you a bit of a, a introduction into all of these kind of contemporary ecological writings of Frank Herbert's Dune and the kind of the, res the initial response to Dune as well in terms of it being an ecological re re uh, book, ecological primer, sorry. So um, and some of these responses are all about how accurate is Dune as an ecological work, this kind of thing. So that's what we'll have tomorrow at 10 o'clock as usual. And we'll follow on live with uh, for the q and I'll just finish off with your questions then and say goodnight, folks, our comments. So Dean says, the best thing about Shelley was that they cremated him, which was a big deal at the time. Byron said his heart would survive the flame. Speaking metaphorically, but it did. Mary Shelley is buried with it. Ah, very interesting. That's quite, that's quite a good detail. Uh, thank you very much for that, Dean. Uh, Dean says, goodnight. Grimdark, goodnight. Ryan, have a good night, everybody. So that, yeah. Everybody, uh, wherever you are in the world, thank you very much for joining me. It's been a great pleasure, and I hope you're all keeping well, and we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, if you can join us, thank you very much, and good night. Good night, all, says Ether. Great show, Doc. Thank you, guys, and all the best. Good night.